What's up in Horizons? This is Juan Cruz and today we're gonna do a little bit of philosophy and explore why the card and the recognized phrase I think therefore I am is wrong and I assure you we will approach it in a way that has almost never done before and it will surprise you. First things first before we can start off with our critique of the card, we must first understand where he was coming from as well as what he was postulating. So let's begin. The card was a 17th century French philosopher who was born in an era in which philosophy was very influenced by religion and dogma everywhere you looked. Most of the arguments that you could hear were backed up by appealing to a god. But the card was different. He was what we nowadays would call a hipster, but back at that time they were called rationalists. He was someone convinced that logic and reason were the primary way in which we could know stuff. Now we have science and technology and it's easy for us to dismiss this idea as obvious, but in 17th century that was not the case. Religious beliefs reign in philosophical discussions as well as in normal conversations, so this stance of trying to use reason to reach at the truth was quite new and peculiar. In 1637 Descartes published a book called The Scores on the Method that included a phrase that marked a turning point in philosophy, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. Almost anyone knows this phrase, you may have seen it in a fancy cup or remember it from high school, but not that many know how he arrived at it, which is the most interesting part of it all. One of the most troubling questions for philosophers, ancient or modern, is how do we know what we know, or better known as epistemology, and this was no different for Descartes. He was obsessed with building a theory of knowledge, an answer to this question of how do we know what we know, purely based on reason and logic alone. The foundations of the theory, he thought, should be unquestionable pillars, because if we got that part wrong, all our beliefs and theories and assumptions might as well be as solid as a sandcastle. So what he did was pretty ingenious. To make sure his theory was based on true observations, he proceeded to examine every belief he had very carefully, only accepting those which there could be no doubt whatsoever. If there was a slight, tiny, small possibility that one belief could not be true, he completely discarded it. In this way, he was making sure he was only believing true things. He started his investigation with sense experience and checked if he could be absolutely trusted. And I ask you, dear watcher, can you trust your senses? How many times did it happen that you thought you saw a friend of yours in the street and when you touched his back, it was a complete stranger? Or when you were young and saw a scary ghost or monster, but by turning your lights on, you realized it was just your chair with a jacket on it? Also, orange juice tastes different after brushing your teeth or when you're sick. There are a lot of examples that shows us that our experience cannot be 100% trusted, and the card reached the same conclusion. So he discarded it. Sense perception was not a completely reliable way to reach at the truth. Then he moved on to intellect. Sure, someone might say, I perhaps cannot trust my senses, but I ain't distrusting my intellect. 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true whether I'm in a dream or I'm colorblind. These are a priori truths. Truths that are true even if my experience is faulty because they are independent of it. But the card would say, yeah, but what if there's an evil demon that's deceiving us and making us believe false stuff? Since you cannot be sure there's one in your head right now, you cannot discard that possibility. And in this way, Descartes throws away any theory of knowledge that's based on intellect and intuition alone. So far, following Descartes' train of thought, we discarded sense experience and reason as a foundation to know the truth. So what are we left with? And it was here that Descartes had a flash of insight and realized that the only thing he could not doubt was doubt in itself. Whoa! Sure, he could be wrong about what he was doubting about, but the activity of doubting itself, of thinking, of being aware of his own thoughts, was indisputable. <laughs> the world might have been in the matrix, his thoughts might have been influenced by Satan himself, but he could not refute his own existence. From this truth, he deduces that if there are thoughts and doubts, there's a thinker thinking them that's different from the body. It is what we nowadays call a mind, a non-material ethereal substance that is us. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And from the existence of a mind, he manages to prove the existence of God and the material universe. In his mind, Descartes has built a theory of knowledge that's 100% bulletproof and based on correct assumptions and observations. He created what is currently known as Cartesian dualism or just dualism, the belief that reality is made out of mind as well as of matter. And here's where most philosophers see the card stray away. They don't see how it could be logical that mind and matter or body and mind influence each other if thought doesn't occupy space and matter does. And while I somehow agree, that's not where the card gets it wrong in my opinion.
We culturally assume that we are the source where thoughts come from. We can think them as we wish, establish conversations in our head, and imagine events that had not happened before. It is our daily experience that we control them, but not 100% and not all the time. We also experience that thoughts come to us and some of them happen automatically. We daydream without even realizing or wanting to. We make ourselves feel worried by thinking about tragic features. And if we sit in meditation, we cannot stop them for even 30 seconds. So on the one hand, we have the experience of thinking thoughts. And on the other hand, we have the experience of receiving thoughts. We call this thinker receptor thoughts mind and we call it I or me. But what are we referring to specifically? Where is this mind located? What shape does it have? What are its characteristics? Where does it come from? The car reached this point but didn't go beyond it. He assumed that the mind was a given, that it was made of ethereal and corporeal substance and was the producer of thought. But he never doubted the nature of the thing we call mind and we personally call I. It is self-validating and obvious that we exist. The fact that you are hearing these words proves it. Apart from merely existing, you are most likely also thinking right now, at least in the background, and we completely take for granted that the one doing that is you, just as Descartes did back in the 17th century. But where is this you in your experience? If you look closely and critically, behind your eyes and between your ears there is nothing more than bodily sensations, and if I were to open your skull and start digging in your brain, we wouldn't find a you, we would find brains and lots of blood. We cannot find neither in our experience nor in the physical world the I or mind doing the thinking. In our experience, thoughts just pop up and we suppose we are somewhere behind the scenes pulling the string. But why do we do that if we cannot locate ourselves? Thoughts might as well be a result of an unconscious process that happens in the brain and we just happen to be aware of the last part of it. Just like the customer that sees food on the supermarket shelves but's completely clueless about the hundreds of processes that need to happen in order for the food to be there in the first place. In short, it's completely obvious that we exist and are aware, but we cannot locate ourselves, we don't know where we come from, and we are not sure if thoughts are thought by us or they are a result of an unconscious mechanism. Descartes believed that when there's thought, there's a thinker, and that the thinker is made of ethereal substance, but that's a mistake that we cannot afford to make. But on the same line, we shouldn't also assume that if we cannot find this I in our experience, it means that it's non-existent and it's just an illusion created by the brain, which is what most scientists do. This is the mystery of the I, which has been troubling scientists and philosophers for decades. And interestingly enough, it is the foundation and main quest for most Asian religions and spiritual pursuits. In this circle, the answer to this question and solution to the mystery is usually referred to as enlightenment or awakening. Sure, we cannot find the eye in the brain or in our experience, but why do we stop there? Why do we either call it mind and forget about it or call it an illusion and mock religions? The experience of sages and mystics across the globe, ancient and modern, shows us that there's a third way we can approach this matter. Through contemplative practices, they assure us, we can have a direct experience of our true nature, of the true nature of the eye, that's beyond words, objects, perceptions, and beyond time. And what's most interesting of it all is that they all describe the same experience, just through a different cultural perspective, but that's a topic for another video. It is important not to confuse this with religions that exist today like Christianity, Buddhism, or Islam. Christ, the Buddha, and Muhammad might have been enlightened, but the problem usually arises when these mystics start teaching what they discovered, and people take it as something to be believed in, rather than something to be experienced for themselves. And that's how religion and dogma begins. So we don't have to believe religion saying that we are an ethereal soul. We don't have to trust science saying that the eye is an illusion. And we don't have to follow the herd believing that you are a mind. We can decide to try to answer the question for ourselves and take responsibility for the matter. As a disclaimer, I'm not the right person to give you advice on how to get enlightened or what's the nature of the eye, since I'm clueless and I'm not enlightened myself. But I highly recommend teachers like Adyashanti or Peter Ralston and his book The Book of Not Knowing as a perfect way to start. I'll leave the link in the description. In conclusion, even though Descartes was a proponent of skepticism, he didn't go all the way through. It never occurred to him to doubt the nature of the doubter itself, and that was his most important mistake. But hey, he did a pretty damn good job considering his day and age. So that's it you all, thank you very much for sticking with me, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it so feel free to leave a comment down below, don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you haven't done it, and if you want to keep watching and blowing your mind away, here's a video you're sure love. See you in the next one!